All right, so this is a suggestion via a donation. Uh, the name of the video is uh, The Weirdest Substance Known to Science. All right, uh, this is coming from uh, Today I Found Out. Let's go and check it out. Today, I'm excited to talk about AG1 by Athletic Greens, my trusty nutritional drink that has become an essential part of my wellness routine. AG1 keeps you covered health-wise. It's super easy to make too. Uh, have to be helium. If there ever was a criminally underrated natural resource, it would have to be helium. Though most commonly associated with party balloons and making one's voice sound like a cartoon, helium's most important application is in cooling the magnets of magnetic resonance imaging or MRI machines. While yeah, helium two is. I don't, I don't think helium one is though. The finite and ever dwindling global supply of this vitally important gas is a topic worthy of its own video. Perhaps even more fascinating is just how bizarre an element helium truly is. For if helium is liquefied and cooled to a low enough temperature, it begins to behave like no other liquid on Earth, seemingly right. violating the laws of gravity, thermodynamics, and even logic itself. This is the story of the superfluid helium-2, the weirdest go. substance known to science. In order for helium to be liquefied, right. it must be cooled to a temperature of minus 268.8 degrees Celsius or 4.2 Kelvin. That's only 4.2 degrees above absolute zero, the coldest temperature theoretically possible. By contrast, nitrogen liquefies at a relatively balmy 77 Kelvin, oxygen at 54 Kelvin, and hydrogen at 33 Kelvin. The reason helium is so difficult to liquefy lies in its electron orbitals being completely filled, making it, like the other noble gases neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon, electrically neutral and chemically inert. This means that the only force which can pull helium atoms together is the so-called van der Waals force, which is caused by electrons shifting from one side of an atom to the other and creating a momentary electrostatic charge. This force is incredibly weak, meaning that helium must be cooled to extremely low temperatures in order for the van der Waals forces to overcome the energy of the moving atoms and pull them close enough together for the gas to liquefy. Solidifying helium is even more difficult, so difficult right. in fact that it cannot be done at regular atmospheric pressures. Only at pressures of 25 atmospheres and above can solid helium be created. At temperatures near 4.2 Kelvin, ordinary liquid helium helium, known as liquid helium-1, largely behaves like any regular liquid, though it does have certain peculiarities. For example, its density is only 0.126 grams per cubic centimeter, or around 13% that of water, while its refractive index, the degree to which light bends as it passes through it, is also 1.025 compared to air, making the surface of liquid helium very difficult to see. But for helium to really start showing its wild side, it must be further cooled to below 2.2 Kelvin, a temperature known as the lambda point. Reaching such temperatures, however, is no easy feat. Indeed, just maintaining helium in liquid form requires the use of Wait, hold on, bro. Liquid helium very difficult to see. But for helium to really start showing its wild side, it must be further cooled to below 2.2 Kelvin, a temperature known as the lambda point. All right, so the lambda point is interesting because, I mean, that's the overall transitional temperature that happens when it goes from uh, helium-1 to helium-2, like he's kind of saying here. Um, but I think... Um, I've never heard. Oh, well, he said he said below two point two. I think the lam the lambda point is like almost exactly two point one four. But either way, it's close enough. So either he or, or I, right? Um, I don't really want to. I guess I could probably just search it, guys. But either way, close enough. That makes sense, guys. Interesting thing about helium two is that. Um, so like a, I think the most interesting part about it, at least, is the, uh, the thermomechanical effects of helium two itself, like when it's exposed to heat, right? It's basically. Um, because obviously you're heating it back up above the, the lambda point, right? Um, and so it, it basically creates an effect called the fountain effect. Basically by putting helium into a test tube, then obviously having like a, like a liquid helium bath, um, and putting about maybe 17% of the actual test tube itself into said helium bath, uh, porous plug at the bottom of the actual test tube itself, and then a heater, a heater basically. And it creates like this squirting effect it's a cool thing if you guys have, have never done it you know i'm not gonna say go try it because you know but um it's a super cool thing to, i'm sure you could probably just um like google or or like go to youtube and check out some random fountain effects of the the thermomechanical effects of uh helium to itself reaching such temperatures however is no easy feat indeed just maintaining helium in liquid form requires the use of a specialized container known as a dwarf flask Basically, a scientific version of a thermos flask, a dewar consists of a double-walled vessel with a vacuum between the walls to prevent heat transfer via convection. These right. walls are often silvered to reflect away any infrared radiation, while liquid nitrogen or oxygen is usually circulated around the dewar to reduce the temperature rise from the inside to the outside of the flask from 289 to around 50 to 70 degrees. Further, cooling is typically achieved by pumping out the dewar with a powerful vacuum pump, causing the helium to boil and heat 
heat to be carried away by the resulting gas. However, while helium's latent heat of vaporization, that is, the energy needed to vaporize a certain mass of liquid, is around 5 calories per gram, its specific heat, the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of that mass by 1 degree Celsius, is around 1 calorie per gram and increases exponentially the colder the helium gets, making it increasingly difficult to lower the temperature any further. But then, as the lambda point of 2.2 Kelvin is reached, the liquid suddenly stops boiling and falls eerily still. The helium has now entered an entirely new phase called liquid helium-2, whose mind-bendingly exotic properties have fascinated and baffled scientists for nearly a century. To give you a small taste of just how bizarre helium-2 is, the reason the Okay, really quickly, guys. So he's saying 2.2. For some reason, I remember reading 2.4, and Wikipedia is saying 2.17. So, um, why do I know 2.14? NASA says 2.14. All right, so now we have an issue here. What is the lambda point of helium? I don't know. <laughs> now I'm confused. I guess whatever, right? It is what it is. It's close enough. Just below 2.2, it's fine. The liquid stops boiling as it crosses the lambda point is because its thermal conductivity has just increased by a whopping 1 million times. In fact, helium-2 is the most thermically conductive substance known to science, conducting heat energy hundreds of thousands of times faster than the best-known solid conductors like copper and silver. The reason normal liquids boil is that they can absorb heat before it can be distributed throughout the liquid mass, causing the liquid to vaporize and bubble away. In helium-2, however, the heat is near instantaneously redistributed throughout the liquid, preventing this from happening. Stranger still, heat does not travel through helium-2 via normal convection, but rather in wave-like pulses called solitons, a phenomenon known sound. as the second sound. Second in a classic sound. experiment conducted in the late 1930s, Soviet physicist Pyotr Kapitsa immersed two sensitive electrical resistors in helium-2, spaced a short distance apart. One resistor was connected to a signal generator and the other to an oscilloscope such that the first produced a series of regular thermal pulses, while the other detected any variations in the liquid's temperature. Using this setup, Kapitsa discovered that the second resistor could detect the thermal pulses from the first mere milliseconds after they were generated, revealing that heat travels through helium-2 at the speed of sound. But if you think that's weird, brace yourself, because things are about to get a lot weirder. Let's say you place some liquid helium in a glass beaker with a bottom made out of sintered ceramic, the pores of which are only a few micrometers in diameter. The temperatures above the... Okay, and then the information you say, you give, also says 2.7. So now who's right here, guys? Is it 2.7 or is it 2.4? Lambda point. The <laughs> I'm just going to say probably 2.7, 2.17. I'm going to say that. 2.17 feels good. I'm not angry at it. Because honestly, if you get to that overall Kelvin, then you're fine. No matter what, I'm almost positive, bro. Just gonna let you guys know. The viscosity of liquid helium-1, that is its resistance to flow, prevents it from flowing through the ceramic. But the moment the helium is cooled below the lambda point, it suddenly drains through the ceramic like a sieve. This flow is so fast that for all intents and purposes, helium-2 no longer has any measurable viscosity. It is, in other yeah. words, a superfluid. And then this is then this is when they use it for like high field magnets and things like that. Um, they also can aid in the, I guess uh, the finding of uh, of uh, super exotic uh, particles. This property manifests in even stranger ways, such as the inability of helium two to be contained in an open topped vessel. Fill a beaker with helium two, and it will climb the inner walls against the force of gravity and leak down the other side, flowing as a liquid film only a couple of atomic diameters or angstroms in thickness. A similar effect occurs when a U shaped tube is filled with extremely fine powder like Jeweler's Rouge and one end is immersed in a vessel of helium-2. The tube immediately acts like a self-priming siphon, causing all the helium to flow out of the vessel. Yet this conclusion is completely contradicted by another classic experiment. In this experiment, a metal cylinder is placed in helium-2 and spun using an external electromagnet. Placed above this cylinder, but not mechanically connected to it, is a lightweight paddle wheel. A few seconds after the cylinder is spun up, the paddle wheel begins to turn. This motion is caused by the boundary layer of fluid adhering to the surface of the cylinder and training other adjacent fluid particles, causing a circular flow that moves the paddle wheel. However, this is only possible if the fluid has some viscosity. In summary, helium-2 displays zero viscosity in certain experiments and a small but fine viscosity in others. This is one of the many apparent contradictions that make superfluid helium-2 so utterly baffling. But by far the most reality-bending property of helium-2 is demonstrated using a hollow glass stem with an open-ended bulb packed with Jules Rouge. When this apparatus is immersed in helium-2 and a beam of light aimed onto the bulb, liquid helium squirts out of the top of the stem. 
the fountain effect. Well, at first glance, I mean, that's a different way to do it, but there we go. Fountain effect still uh, comes. This phenomenon known as the fountain effect may right. not seem all that strange. A closer examination of the physics involved reveals that it should, in fact, actually not do that. Right. For in order it, for the liquid helium to pass into the bulb and up the stem, it must spontaneously travel from a colder region to a hotter region. Some and that's another thing about um, helium too. There's there's no ent there's no entropy at all. Something expressly forbidden up the stem, helium it must two. spontaneously travel from a colder region to a hotter region. Something expressly forbidden by the second law of thermodynamics. So what's going on here? How on earth can helium two break one of the most fundamental right. and thoroughly verified laws of the universe? Are there experiments somehow flawed? Are the laws of thermodynamics actually wrong? Or is helium two so weird that it has a hole in the fabric of reality itself? Bro, the 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 laws of thermodynamics are probably slightly wrong. Like we don't know everything, guys. Um, you know, we just don't know anything. How can we quantify honestly um, helium two? How can we? I don't know. We can't just just enjoy the fountain effect. Literally, just enjoy it. Um, it is our it is one thing on this planet that we just cannot fully come up with you know much around it, guys. That's really it. Um, I would say though, uh, helium three is also another interesting one. It's not as like like polarizing as helium two is, but helium three is also extremely extremely rare, let's say. Well, as it turns out, it's not the above. Though the physics of superfluids are still being actively researched, the best theory physicists have been able to come up with to explain their apparently contradictory behavior is that helium-2 is not one fluid, but rather two. According to this model, one component of the fluid behaves more or less like a normal liquid, while the other superfluid component has no viscosity and can spontaneously flow from cold to hot regions. And just how is this component able to accomplish this? Well, simple. It carries no entropy. Uh, commonly defined as the degree of disorder or randomness within a system, entropy is also a measure of energy, specifically energy that cannot be used to perform useful work. The second law of thermodynamics states that in a closed system, entropy always goes up in proportion to the work done to or by the system divided by the ambient temperature. As cooler substances are more ordered and thus contain less entropy than warmer ones, this means that atoms or molecules always flow from warmer regions to cooler ones and not the other way around. However, if helium-2 carries no entropy, then it is free to flow in the opposite direction, allowing the creation of a pump that requires no mechanical pumping. Like I said, simple. But now comes no. <laughs> the real question. Why does helium-2 behave this way? And the answer, surprisingly, has to do with quantum mechanics. Describing okay. the behavior of matter at very small scales, the world of quantum mechanics is more strange and fantastical than anything Alice could ever have found down the rabbit hole or through the looking glass. It is a world where the laws of causality give way to the laws of probability, where particles can be in multiple places at once, communicate with each other instantaneously from opposite sides of the universe, and even change their properties based on whether or not they are being observed. Normally, such strange effects are only observable at the scale of atoms and subatomic particles. But in superfluid helium-2, they become visible at much larger scales, explaining why the substance behaves so differently from most ordinary matter. Indeed, the reason helium-2 exhibits superfluidity and near-infinite thermal conductivity is because, unlike in regular fluids, the atoms in helium-2 all occupy the same quantum state, allowing them to act as one large wave function. To explain exactly what this means would take several extra videos, but thankfully for no, as Good, a useful actually. analogy. To quote him, assume that you go to a crowded space and people walk kind of randomly. They run into each other, they bump into each other, there's lots of friction. And if you want to cross the streets, and there are many, many people in the street, it can take forever. But now imagine all the people march in lockstep. If all the people march in lockstep, there is no friction. There is no elbowing anyone, and all the people can quickly cross the street because they are all walking together. Quantum mechanics also explains why some types of helium are easier to turn into superfluids than others. The most common isotope of helium is helium-4, whose nucleus has two protons and two neutrons. This is the type of helium that becomes a superfluid at 2.2 Kelvin. By contrast, the much rarer helium-3, which is one fewer neutron, only becomes a superfluid at millikelvin temperatures, that is, a few thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. The reason has to do with the property of particles called spin and a law of quantum mechanics called the Pauli exclusion principle. Though often described as a particle's angular momentum, in reality, spin is a purely quantum mechanical 
property with no direct counterpart in classical mechanics, the name deriving from an early theory since disproven that particles literally spun about their axes. One way to understand spin is as a particle's rotational symmetry. That is, the number of times it must be rotated to return to its original state. This is given by its spin quantum number, which can be a positive or negative integer or fraction. For example, a spin zero particle is identical in any orientation. A spin one particle must be rotated once or 360 degrees to return to its original state, and a spin one two particle must be rotated twice or 720 degrees. According to the standard model of physics, all matter in the universe is divided into two types of particles. Fermions, which have fractional spins like 1, 2, 3, 2, and so on, and bosons, which have integer spins like 0, 1, 2, etc. Further, according to the Pauli exclusion principle, first described by Austrian physicist Wolfgang Pauli in 1925, are we talking about Higgs boson? Five, two fermions cannot occupy the same quantum state within the same quantum system. Since helium-4 is a boson with a spin of zero, it is exempt from this rule and form a superfluid in which all its atoms share the same quantum state. Helium-3, by contrast, is a fermion with a spin of 1, 2 and cannot be made into a superfluid in the same temperatures. At Miller-Kelvin temperatures, however, pairs of helium-3 combine in twos to form what are known as Cooper pairs, which act as bosons and can become superfluid. Clear as mud, everybody? So, what does it all mean? Aside from being a mind-bending macro-scale demonstration of quantum weirdness, do superfluids like helium-2 have any practical applications? Well, no, not yet, but the physics of superfluids are directly applicable to another unusual low-temperature phenomenon, superconductivity. At temperatures below 30 Kelvin, many materials suddenly- like, To my knowledge, the only thing that they've ever really had any real usages for would be for being like being placed onto like high yield magnets. They lose all resistance to electrical flow, magnets. meaning an electric current established within said materials would continue to circulate forever without loss so long as the critical temperature is maintained. Superconductors also reject magnetic fields, meaning magnets will levitate above them. This effect is already widely exploited in high-powered superconducting magnets such as those in MRI machines, the primary application of liquid helium. However, more extensive use of superconductors is stymied by the ultra-low temperatures required to achieve this effect, with even so-called high-temperature superconductors having critical temperatures around 90 Kelvin. This is where the study of superfluids comes in, since according to a 1957 theory by John Bardeen, Leon Cooper, and John Schreifer, the flow of current through a superconductor can be thought of as a superfluid composed of Cooper pairs of electrons. The study of superfluidity may thus one day unlock the secret to the holy grail of electrical engineering, room temperature superconductors, which would allow for ultra-efficient electrical transmission and storage and hundreds of other revolutionary technologies. So helium-2 is not merely the weirdest substance known to science, it may one it's day wonderful. change the course of human civilization. Huh? Guys, I never honestly thought too deeply regarding you know, helium-2. Like, Honestly, any type of practical applications. Um, if we can, if we could find some type of like, like room temperature, as you said, uh, you know, superconductor that could open up a lot for us. Actually, guys, right? Um, we, we no longer have to worry about storage at all of of it, and we can still use it for um, all of our needs, electrical needs, at least, guys. Um, guys, I love this man. All right, I love how he speaks, guys. <laughs> I love what he teaches. Um, his delivery is easy to obviously maintain. This is something I probably am going to send um, to my wife because we're actually having a discussion um, of, of kind of a, in proximity to this overall topic earlier today. Um, I think she'd actually enjoy this one, seriously. Um, but all right, listen, you guys all have an absolutely amazing day and enjoy your day uh, thoroughly.